Hello everyone, I'm here to do a lecture on negligence for the California Bar Exam portion or a torts essay. And, um, this can also be used for the first year law school exam or the mini bar. I did take the mini bar and I had a, a negligence question on there. Um, so now I'm preparing for the California Bar Exam. So this can be used for both first year law school exam or the California Bar Exam. And it's on negligence. First, uh, first the way I do my videos is I give you your rules and all of the elements, and then we give we do kind of an approach of how to write up that portion of the bar exam. And also, a lot of this can be used for MBEs. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Negligence. Now, for prima facie cases for negligence, um, usually I see what on the bar exam, some of the model answers I've actually read and went over, which I've done a lot of them. I do see that uh, people do start off with negligence as their head note, and then they do put the prima facie case and how to accomplish that, which is the rule here. So a defendant's conduct imposes an unreasonable risk upon another, which results in injury to that other person. So the plaintiff must prove the following elements, and we all know these, duty, breach, causation, and damages. I remember causation stems from actual cause and proximate cause and damages okay so that's what you would start with that's basically the rule and then we move to our next slide which is duty of care so we would start with duty of care the rule on that is a person has a duty to act as a reasonable person there are two duty considerations so we're going to consider to whom the duty is owed and our second one is applicable standard of care and we'll talk about that in a second now, to him, the duty is owed is when we talk about Cardozo, the Cardozo view and the Andrews view. And remember, the Cardozo view is foreseeable plaintiffs in the zone of danger. And Andrews is everyone. Everyone, including the unforeseeable plaintiffs. So Andrews includes everyone in the zone. And Cardozo is the zone of danger. So I, I always think of Cardozo zone, Z and Z. That's how I remember that. Cardozo zone of danger. And Andrews is everyone. So do write those up, a quick sentence or two. I've seen a lot of them on the model answers, so they do want that. And let's move on to our next one. Standard of care. So now that's the second part of duty of care. First you do your rule, and then we're gonna, number one, to whom the duty is owed. That's when we go and do Cardozo and Andrews, a quick little write-up. And then number two would be a quick applicable standard of care. Now, the general rule is a person has a duty to act as a reasonable person under the circumstances unless a special duty arises. And of course, most likely you're gonna get a special duty on the exam or you're gonna have an MBE with that special duty exception. So that these are big. And I do have all of those written down for you. Not all of them I have seen on an exam, but I did put all of them on the slide for you. Okay, so a person has a duty to act as a reasonable person, very important in torts, reasonable under the circumstances unless a special duty arises. So let's go ahead and talk about our special duty. Special duties, there's quite a few of them. I, special duties, I do, I'm trying to move my stuff here because I can't see what I, oh, there we go. Special duties, I have a mnemonic, all pets can bring lots of love nicely. It's A for affirmative duty to act. Let me take this off for a second. Affirmative duty to act, P, pets for professionals, C, for children, B, bailment duties, um, L, L for land, owners and occupiers of land, uh, another L for landlord tenant, and N for negligence per se. Okay, so all pets can bring lots of love nicely. Now I see a lot of these on MBEs. It's really important to know the rules on these for MBEs. Um, essays, not so much. I know negligent per se has been a big portion of an essay that I've read, a couple essays. And children are definitely on MBEs, children, okay? And affirmative duties to act, they're on there too because they give a lot of trick questions on those if you're supposed to, the affirmative duty to act, let's go over those actually, are you getting those? Yes, here we go. Affirmative duties to act, so the rule. Defendant generally has, n oh, there's an error right there, you see that? No duty to act. Okay, so defendant generally has no duty to act to help plaintiff except if there's a special relationship. And what they mean by special relationship is uh, if they are, let's see, I have to remember that. Um, special rela relationship, such as a business or land 
owner holding premises open to the public or landlords or tenants or husband and wife or uh, mother, daughter, things like that, okay? Um, except if there's a special relationship, then they do have a duty to act, causing the danger. If they actually cause the danger and the conduct placed the plaintiff in danger, then that's when they have a duty to act. The defendant has a duty to act also. Volunteer assistance. So if you're going to go volunteer, you must proceed volunteering with reasonable care. Okay, so that's a tricky one. These are all in MBEs, these three right here. So those volunteer assistance causing the danger or special relationship, you must act on that. Otherwise, generally, defendant has no duty to act except in these three situations. Uh, let's see, professionals rule required to pos required to possess the same knowledge or skill of a member of their profession. Another error here. So required to possess the same knowledge or skill of a member of their profession. That's the rule for professionals. Um, there's always a fireman's rule, which I see a lot on MBEs. Um, prohib it's like police officers, firefighters, and other professional risk takers who are injured are prohibited from suing for negligence. They're not allowed to. Or injuries sustained from the risk they assume with their profession. So you gotta make sure that the injury they sustained was during, you know, was a risk that they assume doing what they do, a fireman, police officer, and they're not allowed to sue for the negligence or negligence on that. Okay, so that's the fireman's rule. I've seen MBEs on that one also. Children rule, the same intelligence, same age, and same ex and experience is what they use for children. So they have a duty to conform to the conduct of a child of like age, intelligence, and experience. Of course, the exception to that, which I've seen on MBEs, is a child engaged in adult activity. They're going to be held to the standard of an adult. So that's an exception for the children. You have to know that one. They'll be had, held to the standard of an adult if they're engaged in adult activity. I've seen 14-year-olds um, in the MBE driving a car, driving a tractor, so they consider that adult activity. Bailment duties, I haven't seen anything on these. Um, the rule, bail, bailer duties and bailey duties, um, I didn't really, the bailer must inform of a known dangerous defects in the chattel, so kind of like land. Um, the bailer duties, that's what they have to do. The bailey duties, standard of care depends on who benefits from the bailment. Okay, so you guys can look those up. I haven't seen these, but they are on here because they're on part of my list. Let's go to the L for land. Owners, occupiers of land, this is big. The rule standard of care depends on dam where the damage occurs. Does it occur outside the land? Does it occur outside the land? Or does the damage occur on the premises? Now, if it's outside the land, which I have here, and it's a natural condition, there's no duty owed by the land owner or occupier. Now, if it's an artificial condition, the duty exists to prevent one out outside the premises, talking about outside right now, from damage caused by an unreasonable risk of harm or unreasonable dangerous artificial hazards. Okay, so there's difference here. Outside natural condition, there's no duty. Artificial, you do have to know your elements and write that up. Now let's say, this is landowners continued, um, damages occur on the premises. If the damages occur on the premises, okay, you have to look at the status of the plaintiff first. Are they a trespasser, an invitee, a licensee, or a landlord tenant? You do have to look at their status first. And that's going to determine your standard of care. Okay? Now, trespassers, basically there's no duty owed to undiscovered trespassers or invitees, licensees that go beyond the scope of invitation. So if they're undiscovered and they're not known or should have been known, then really there's no duty owed. Now, of course, we have exceptions. These are the ones I see on MBs, the exceptions here. Exceptions, and I put, of course. Uh, so one, known or frequent trespasser. So even though, even though the person is a trespasser, if they're known to the la landowner or occupier or they're frequent, then there is a duty to warn because you know about them and they'll tell you in the MBs they're known. Okay, and if they're not, there's no duty. If they're known, there is a duty. 
and B is attractive nuisance doctrine. There's five elements to that, and I think I've seen lots of those on MBE too. I didn't put the elements on here, but the five elements for um, for attractive nuisance doctrine, of course, has to do with children. A landowner must exercise ordinary care to avoid foreseeable injury to children. I've seen tons of MBEs on this, including leaving a slide that's on the side of a building, leaving a trampoline that's on the side, and a little, uh, I think a 12-year-old puts it down and decides to jump on it, and it busts, and it, and it gives them injury. So you have to read those and just kind of, they're all basically the same. They just use different trampoline or something that's inside of their premises. And so for the five elements, I'll do them real quick. Number one, the owner knew or should have known that the area is one where children will trespass. So if the area is one where the children will trespass, that's an element. The condition poses an unreasonable risk or injury or serious injury or death. The children do not discover the risk or realize the danger due to their youth. So you're going to look at youth too. So if you have a 12 year old, you're going to come up here and work. You know, you're also going to need standard of care for maybe an adult, depending on what they're doing. Um, number four, the benefit to the owner and expense to remedy the condition is slightly compared to the risk. So if the owner knows a way to, ben uh, to actually fix this, he should try to at least fix it and not just leave it there because the risk is going to be greater than him trying to fix it. Five, the owner fails to use reasonable care to eliminate the danger. So that's number five. So owners continued, if it's an invitee, it's, oh, that means they're open to the public. An owner has a duty to make reasonable inspection to find hidden dangers and remedy. Uh, licensee enters with owner's consent. This is like people you invite to your home. As they have a duty to warn of all known dangerous conditions that the licensee is unlikely to discover on their own. Okay, so if a licensee can discover something on their own, then the owner is not going to be liable. So no duty to repair or inspect. And both invitee and licensee are on MBEs also. Landlord tenant standards of care, the leasee, which is the tenant, general duty to maintain the premises, landlord, which is the lessor, warn of existing dangers, which he knows or should have known that tenant is not likely to discover. So here we go again, can the tenant discover it? Is it reasonable for them to discover it? If not, then the landlord must warn of those dangers. And the landlord has a duty not to repair negligently. You're going to go in there and repair something that can't be done negligently. And maintain common areas. Use reasonable care to maintain those common areas, okay? Get a lot of MBs on these common areas right here. Negligence per se. This is a violation of statute. This is a violation of statute that can establish the duty and breach elements of negligence. So defendant is negligence per se if they meet these three elements, they violate the statute, unless it's excused. Of course, we're gonna have some exceptions here. So if it's excused, then, this, then that's not an element that's going to be met. Number two, plaintiff is within the class of the statute designed to protect. And number three, statute designed to protect against the risk or accident that's suffer, suffered by plaintiff. So they'll give you a statute in the fact pattern, either it's an essay or an MBE, and then they'll leave one of these out here. They'll say, you know, they'll say that they got injured but they weren't part of the class that that statute was trying to protect. So you really do have to know your elements here. Now, if they violate the statute, but it's excused, so compliance would create a greater risk of harm, defendant was in, incapacitated or defendant was unaware of factual circumstances, that made the statute applicable. So if they were excused from doing that, or let's say the statute was focusing on one thing and the defendant did not meet that piece that the statute was focusing on, then it's not, they're not going to be. They're not going to be liable for negligence per se because they didn't meet all three elements. You have to know if it's excused or not, okay? Now, negligence per se by itself, when you write your rule, when you go through your elements, it's going to establish duty and breach. But the defendant must still prove causation and damages. So you still have to write through your causation and damages, your actual cause and proximate cause here, and the damages. Um, compliance with the statute does not establish that defendant was not negligent. So you just really have to go through your rules, argue your facts, use your facts in the fact pattern to match them up with your elements, okay? That's negligence per se. Now this is big on MBs and I've seen in my essays. So we're done with all of those. Let's go to breach now. Breach, you know the rule for breach. Uh, res, ipsa, see a lot of this. Um, this can be used 
to establish breach in situations where the event that transpired creates an inference that D was probably negligent. And I do see these on MBEs. So an accident is the type that normally does not occur without negligence. You had to really look at your facts. And other causes that could have prevented this by plaintiff or third party are eliminated by the evidence. So no way you look at it. There's no way that the jury's going to look at it. There's no way the attorney or the court are going to look at this and say, you know what, this is no matter what is negligence because normally this type of thing does not occur. Okay, so I do see a lot of MBs on that one. Causation now, we have AC and PC, actual cause, proximate cause. Actual cause is the but for test. Proximate cause is the foreseeability test. We have to remember the eggshell plaintiff. This is a lot on the MBEs now. The defendant takes the plaintiff as he finds him. So all the injuries stem from that, he's, he's tend to be liable for. Intervening causes now, D liable for all foreseeable intervening causes. All foreseeable intervening causes. If they're not foreseeable, the D cannot be liable for them. Uh, D generally not liable for unforeseeable superseding intervening causes. And this is where it breaks the chain of causation. You do have to go through your facts and it's something that was unforeseeable, then D is generally not liable for it. So approximate cause is the foreseeability test. And usually on essays, approximate cause is where we write up a lot of facts, these facts in more than, you know, one sentence, because this is where they want your arguing to go. And eggshell, I've seen a lot on MBEs. We have damages, last thing. Actual, when there has to be an actual injury to P. Nominal is not available. Recover, out of pocket, that stems from the injury. Direct loss, that stems from the injury. Pain and suffering, that stems from the injury. And loss, ability to enjoy life. So that's the recovery. Damages must be harm caused by defendant's conduct. We've got to prove that. Must be able to be calculated with certainty. And P must mitigate damages. They must go try to, plaintiff must try to mitigate, like go seek treatment. Um, punitives, only if the actions were willful and wanted. So normally punitives are not allowed unless they're willful and wanted. Okay. I've seen that on MBE, so negligence, you're not awarded, you're usually never awarded punitives. Let's go through our approach real quick. So our approach would be to write our negligence prima facie case first, then the duty of care, we have two, to whom the duty is owed, and the applicable standard of care. Now the standard of care you're gonna know is a general rule unless you have a special duty, and the special duties are all pets can bring lots of love nicely, you write these up. After that, you're going to go to affirmative, you know, go through your affirmative duties if there's any, professional duties, children, bailment, owners, occupiers of land, owners continued, owners continued, invitee licensee, owners continued, landlord tenant. And then we, if we have a negligence per se, we write it up. After that, we go to our breach, was a res ipsa or involved, we write up that. And then we go to causation, right? If your actual cause, proximate cause, don't forget, proximate cause has a lot of argument, arguments there usually. And finally, we write up damages. What are their damages and are they going to receive? What type of damages they're going to receive? Okay, so that's pretty much the approach. And that's it. So let's go back to negligence per se. So that's my negligence. I went a little quick on it, but honestly, when you're on the bar exam, you kind of have to know stuff quickly. And my notes, I use these because I don't write every piece of information down that are in all these books that I'm studying. I write what I need to know, what role I need to know. And basically the roles, you can't remember everything. So the way I do it is I just know when I'm taking an MB, when I'm reading an MB, I just know, okay, this is the role piece by piece. I don't remember, I don't memorize it exactly. I just gotta know how it works. So that's what I try to do. I do essays and MBs on negligence and I do a ton of them. Okay, so that's the, I'm finished and that's the lecture for the day. And next, I think I'm going back to do, what am I going back to do next? I have it here on my PowerPoint. Let's see, new, yeah. No, I don't. Okay, so my homeschool, my channel on YouTube is PLC Homeschool. Okay, so good luck on the bar exam and thanks for listening.